Today I'm coming to you from the window of St. Vincent de Paul as we do a tour of the stained glass windows of St. Catherine's Church. And as I'm standing here next to the window of St. Vincent de Paul, I'm sure that's a name that many parishioners are familiar with because here at St. Catherine's we have a St. Vincent de Paul Society. And the St. Vincent de Paul Society does many chari charitable activities to help those who are in need. Even during the strange coronavirus time, they still continue to perform so many charitable activities to those who are in so much need during this time. And so I would ask that you pray for them and all the charitable activities they do. There's also St. Vincent de Paul Societies all throughout parishes in the United States, and there's even ones abroad. So it's a very influential organization, and it's founded after the example of the saint we're near today, St. Vincent de Paul. When St. Vincent de Paul was born, he was born to a family that was of rather modest means. They weren't a wealthy family by any stretch of the imagination, and there were four boys in the family, and there were two girls in the family, and he fell somewhere in the middle. When he was very young, his dad noticed that he was very intelligent, that he had a knack for learning. And so his dad sent him to go to school and he went to a Franciscan school. And eventually after that, he went to the University of Toulouse. My French, please pardon my French, because my French is not very adept. So he went to that university. And then after that, he eventually became a priest. And what was very unique about him, he was ordained at the early age of 20. So that was something rather unique at that time. After he was ordained, when he was first ordained a priest, he lived a life that was rather comfortable. He wasn't very zealous for spirituality. He just lived a very unchallenging, comfortable life. And he wanted to gain lots of money. That was important to him. He even became, one of his first assignments as a priest was to become chaplain to Queen Margaret. And as he was chaplain to her, he made sizable amounts of money. That certainly helped him. He went, one of his first Inklings of conversion happened when he went to visit a priest friend in, Par in Paris, and when, uh, went to visit a friend in Paris. And when he went to visit that particular friend, that particular friend got robbed. And he was convinced that no one else could have done it except Vincent. And so he would slander him and he would say all sorts of bad stuff about him. And this went on for weeks until the true person that actually robbed his friend came forward and confessed. And St. Vincent, sometime after that, he said, only God knows the truth. And he said, in moments such as that, the best thing we can do is to bear it, bear it in patience, humble silence, and resignation. And those are the best defense of our innocence, and always the happiest means to sanctity in our souls. When he was in Paris, he also became acquainted with a very holy priest there, whose name was Father Peter, who would later become a cardinal in the church. And he also became acquainted with St. Francis de Sales, who wrote a very influential book on the uh, interior life. A wonderful book if you ever want to pick that up and read it. So he became inter acquainted with some very prominent people um, during that time. It was sometime when he was in Paris that he had to go to, he was asked to go hear the confession of a very poor peasant in the countryside. And when he went to go hear the confession of this poor peasant, he was, this is when his care and concern for the poor really became noticeable because he saw the dire straits that the poor were in at that time. It was something he was not as aware of before. And when he saw that, he was deeply moved. And so he went into the church and he began to preach on the sacrament of confession. And many people would come to the sacrament of confession. Many of the poor would come to him for the sacrament of confession. And that really prompted his concern and care for the poor that lasted for the rest of his lifetime. After that, he was sent to become pastor of a parish. He went to a rather small parish called Chatillon les Stones, maybe? Any of French speakers, I apologize. And when he was sent there, he preached often, and he converted many people. And when he converted many people, there was one in particular, the count of that town, who lived a notoriously sinful lifestyle. And even because of his preaching, he was able to convert him. So he converted many people of that parish to a more sanctifying lifestyle. Shortly after arriving there, though, they, he was sent to work with the Galloway slaves in Paris. And when he went to... Uh, priestly minister as a priest to the Galloway slaves, he was eventually appointed chaplain to them. Again, we're seeing this repeating occurrence of him really having care and concern for those who are in need. And so he begins to help those who are less unfortunate, those slaves, and even during that time, and this is where you see some of the uniqueness about him, because he's obviously showing this deep concern for the poor, then he also has this particular gift for working with, the, for ministering to those who are wealthy. And so there was a very wealthy family at that time, the Madame de Gandhi family, or she was the Madame of the family, and they were a very influential, wealthy family during that time. And she went to Vincent in particular and said, 
I want you to basically minister to me until my death. And she also said, I want you to start a zealous group to take care of those who are in need. And at first, he thought he was not up to that task. In his humility, he said, that's not for me. Eventually, he did go on to join this new community, and obviously this community became named after him. They're called the Vincentians, the Order of Missions. And so, when he was part of that group, obviously they showed care and concern for the poor in many ways, and another important aspect for him was the priests were known to be fairly lax at that time, and so he had a strong desire for the reform of the presbytery. And so much of his time and energy was spent caring for the poor, obviously, caring for those who were in need, and also making sure that he was re-energizing a priestly spirit within the priests of that area. And it was also during that time that he got together a group of wealthy women. Again, you're seeing this influence where he's caring for those who are poor, but he also has this ability to minister to those who are of more, you know, more uh, exceptional means. And so he gathered together all these wealthy women of Paris. And from these wealthy women of Paris, he established an order called the Ladies of Charity. And with the Ladies of Charity, what they did was they would obviously collect sums of money, and then they would distribute those sums of money to people who were in need. And so again, you're seeing him care for the needy, but you're also seeing a very practical side where he's able to work with the wealthy. And as he works with the wealthy, he's able to bring them into the mission of the church. And he would also go on to found many hospitals, and these hospitals were known to be of exceptional quality, and they were always caring for the sick, and they were caring for the aged, and he would raise large sums of money for these hospitals. And they had some of the best regulations of all the hospitals of that time. And what's also tends to be very unique about him, is something we know on a more human side, is he was known to be a very angry man. He said this of himself. He said, if it were not for grace, he would be very angry. He even said of himself, if it were not for grace, I would be hard and repulsive, rough and cross. Grace changed him. And what's most unique about that is, even though he did have that spirit of anger, humility became one of the defining characteristics of his congregation, the defining characteristics of the Vincentians. So you really see how grace transforms what nature can accomplish. And so he said of his own congregation that the mission and purpose of his congregation was to instruct the ignorant, bring sinners to repentance, and to plant the gospel spirit of humility, meekness, and simplicity in the hearts of all Christians. Towards the end of his life, as happens with many saints, he suffered much, he was in serious ill health, and he eventually passed in 1660. He went on to be canonized by Clement XII in the year 1737, and Pope Leo XIII made him the patron saint of charitable societies in the church. I'm sure many of you are aware, our own bishop in this diocese, Bishop David O'Connell, he was ordained for the Vincentian Order. And so, because of him and his leadership of the diocese, we obviously have a special connection with the Vincentians, and we also gives us a more robust connection to the St. Vincent de Paul Societies all throughout the parishes in our diocese. His feast day is on September 27th, and his body is in the city of Paris, once I have got to go there, and when I went there, it's a very unique place. His body is located, the altar's here. His body is located all the way above the altar, and you have to go up these two stairs, and as you go up the two stairs, you come to his body. Now, his body, when he was first, after he passed, since he was so saintly, his body was incorrupt. And for those who don't know, when someone is known to live a very saintly life, so often what they'll do is they'll dig up their body after they pass, and one of the signs of their sanctity, for some, is that their bodies will be incorrupt, meaning they will have no decay. And St. Vincent de Paul, when they dug his body up, his body wasn't corrupt. So that's why it's on display above the main altar. Sometime after that, though, there was a flood that affected the area, and during that time, his body did decompose. So now what you see there is a wax figure of him, most likely, but his remains are still present there. So his relics, his remains, are still present at that church, if you're ever in Paris. And then right around the corner from that church is another church, which is the Shrine of the Miraculous Medal. That's where St. Catherine Labore had an image of Mary, and Mary told her, have a medal struck and have people wear it, and they can get, grace, get great grace for themselves. And in that Shrine of the Miraculous Medal is where the relics of St. Vincent de Paul's heart are. So his heart is in that church. And also in that church is... The woman who helped found the Daughters of Charity, which was also founded in the spirit of St. Vincent de Paul, the founders of that order is also located in that church. 
And so the closest place, if you ever want to see an incorrupt body around here, obviously we can't travel now, the closest place to see an incorrupt body um, that I'm aware of around here is at the St. John Newman Shrine in Philadelphia. You can certainly go there and there is the incorrupt body of St. John Newman. So these are obviously very important things. Now the one thing I'm a little bit unsure of is in this image, he's holding what looks to be a building. It doesn't look to be a house. It looks maybe, doesn't look to be a church, I mean. Um, so maybe it's a hospital, maybe it's some of the religious houses he found in. If anyone has any sense why he would be holding that building in this particular image, you're certainly welcome to comment in the, you know, comment in the description box below. It certainly would be kind of curious to know why he's holding that. So obviously this slide, the life of St. Vincent de Paul was very important. He was a man of great influence in the church. We're certainly aware of that. So we continue to seek his intercession, we continue to pray for him, and in particular, we continue to model our life after him when we care for those who are in need. God bless.